everybody, here we are with uh, Michael Lloyd again, because I think that this is our third or fourth interview, and I love this man that is a psychologist, psychotherapist, and probably, in my opinion, one of the best brief psychotherapy in the world. Hello, Michael, again. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Thank Great you. Time to Thank you for being here again. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to have a, um, a chat with you, uh, talking with you about psychotherapy. And um, today we talk about, uh, with Michael, we talk about brief psychotherapy to understand something behind brief psychotherapy and something behind uh, some brief psychotherapies. So, Michael, um, are you ready? Yes. Okay. I'm looking behind your shoulder. I see a book, the Uncommon Case Book about Milton oh. Erickson. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good book. And you suggested me that book. It's, it's an, an incredible yeah. book. Everybody should yeah. read Uncommon Therapy, Uncommon, um, Uncommon Case Book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So, about brief psychotherapy. Um, my first question is, how came psychotherapy became brief? I mean, uh, in your book, Brief Psychotherapies, that now we have the uh, Italian translation, Psychotherapy and Brevi, fantastic. You describe some interesting point about how psychotherapy became brief. Can you give okay. us uh, just an idea? Okay. How did therapy become brief? Yeah. I usually think of psychotherapy as starting with Freud in the 1890s and 1900 and then onward. As I wrote in the book, Brief Psychotherapies, uh, I gave a little history. Freud's early cases were brief. Sometimes they were even single session, like Katarina and Gustav Mahler, and then they became longer and longer. So maybe the better question is, why did therapy become long instead of why is it brief? Yeah. Become long. Well, psychoanalysis was just developing then, and it was largely a research instrument. And they found that if the therapist remained passive and didn't say very much and let the therapy go on and on, interesting phenomena seemed to emerge, transference and the Oedipal complex and this kind of an idea. So some early efforts to have the therapist be more active and focused were tried notably by Otto Rank and Sandor Ferenczi. Uh, uh, but some of their methods were questionable. Uh, in a couple of cases, they had a patient sit on their lap, yeah. for instance. Uh, and the time wasn't right for revisionism yet because psychoanalysis was still trying to establish itself. Even yeah. Freud, in his last great paper, which is called Analysis Terminable and Interminable, but it could also be translated as Analysis finite or endless, even Freud was complaining about there was relatively limited therapeutic benefits and he wanted the development of new methods that would use some psychoanalytic principles. So um, moving ahead in the history, a major influence toward briefer therapy was World War II. Until then, psychotherapy was mostly a long-term luxury for the well-to-do people, but the war was on and there were soldiers who were shell-shocked, now we would say they had PTSD, and they needed to be taken care of, and if possible they needed to be uh, uh, helped so they could return to the fighting. Uh, so several things resulted. One thing was psychologists became genuine therapists. Until then, psychologists mostly did psychological testing and social workers mostly did home visits to see how the children were. But that ther they needed more therapists, so psychologists and social workers became active clinicians, became real therapists. A second was group therapy became much more popular. The idea of being more efficient, we'll see 12 people or eight people at one time. And in the United States, the Veterans Administration, VA, it's called Veterans Administration Medical Centers started to take care of all the veterans. And these became training uh, and research sites and a lot of shorter term therapy was being done there. More emphasis was getting put on coping, 
ego functions, on efficiency, uh, and on reality factors like money and return to work. All those things became more important. Right after World War II, in 1946, uh, Franz Alexander and Thomas French wrote a very important book called Psychoanalytic Therapy um, Theory and Application. Uh, it was called. They coined the phrase, the corrective emotional experience. They recommended that the therapist would change his behavior or her behavior to fit the particular patient. Sometimes you would be strict, sometimes you would be more indulgent to try to give the person the experience they needed, a corrective emotional experience. So they were beginning to suggest different approaches with different people. At the same time, in the 1950s, different workers were exploring ways to make psychodynamic therapy more efficient and more effective. And at the same time, Fritz Perls was working on Gestalt therapy, Albert Ellis was developing rational emotive behavior therapy, which was the first really systematic form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, Eric Byrne was developing transactional analysis. So there were lots of things going on in the early 1950s. They wanted to find some way to make therapy faster, better, more effective than just long-term psychoanalysis. Especially for our interests, in the early 1950s, Gregory Bateson, who was an anthropologist and a philosopher, he was studying communication. And he got a research grant, and he sent Jay Haley and John Weakland to see what this fellow, Milton Erickson, yeah. was doing in Arizona. So this led to a whole different ways of thinking about problems and solutions, cybernetics and interpersonal influence, these ideas, looking at what was going on in the present that maintained a problem rather than assuming problems resided in the individual's past. Erickson also changed the emphasis from the unconscious being a place of conflicts and problems to a place of unappreciated capacities yeah. and potential solutions. All that led to the idea of utilization. Haley eventually, uh, Haley was the first editor of Erickson's collected papers, and then eventually Haley edited these three volumes of conversations with Milton Erickson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so then, moving ahead a little bit more, the Mental Research Institute, MRI, in Palo Alto, was founded in the 1960s by Don Jackson, who had worked with Harry Stack Sullivan. Harry Stack Sullivan was famous for the interpersonal theory of psychiatry. Richard Dick Fish started to direct the Brief Therapy Center. Uh, Haley and many other people were there. I have a list here. Paul Watzlewicz, John Weakland, Chloe Madonis, Virginia Satir, <clears throat> other people like R.D. Lang, Irving Yalom, Salvador Mnuchin, they all came to visit. Yeah. Years later, I once asked Jay Haley, why did you call it Brief Therapy? And he said, well, it's mostly just to make it different than long-term therapy. <laughs> psychoanalytic therapy. Uh, Steve DeShazer and Insu Berg also studied at MRI and met there. Uh, in 1982, Steve wrote a book called Patterns of Brief Family Therapy, and he was really doing strategic therapy. They were assigning directives that would counter different behavior problems. Uh, later, he got more interested in solution formation and developed solution-focused brief therapy. I should say, uh, the first time I taught at MRI some years ago, on the wall in the seminar room facing me while I looked at the audience, on the wall were photos of Don Jackson, Gregory Bateson, Milton Erickson, Jay Haley, Paul Watzlawick, John Weakland, Dick Fish, Virginia Satir, and other first-generation luminaries. It was overwhelming. Like, my heroes in my bibliography were looking at me and watching me. Very nervous, I remember that. Uh, some years later, in the United States, there was the managed care movement, which was had to do with insurance. But the managed care, and I wrote about it in a book called Brief Therapy and Managed Care. Uh, uh, sometimes there were a lot of problems with managed care. Sometimes I called it mangled care. But what, but what was a messed up or mangled care? But in terms of brief therapy, what was important was there was a further emphasis being put on getting results and accountability. Yeah. In 1988, 
the Milton H. Erickson Foundation had the first brief therapy conference. They held it in San Francisco. I was there, and my co-presenters, Moshe Talmud uh, and Bob Rosenbaum, were there, and we gave our first paper on single-session therapy, and that turned into the book Single Session Therapy by Moshe Talmud, right? Uh, and there have been many conferences since. The next brief therapy conference, as you know, Flavio, will be in December this year in a couple months, yeah. And you will be as a presenter, and so I. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's it's incredible because uh, you succeed in talking about brief psychotherapy histories uh, in in a in a very short time in uh, five yeah. minutes. Fantastic. Um, yeah. That's great. And if someone else, uh, if someone wants to. Um, expand to explore all this history can find in your book, uh, book Brief Psychotherapy uh, a lot of details and uh, a lot yeah. of yeah, a lot of the details about uh, I, I know some things about it but there's areas I don't know and I may not always be completely accurate so I hope other people will add their ideas yeah. and this is important and that was important let me talk about Erickson yeah, yeah, yeah because uh, I've never met Erickson unfortunately I wish I yeah. had Uh, but for many of you, please go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, because there, there is a, a thing about Ericsson in particular that uh, is fascinating for me, because, uh, you know, Ericsson was probably the most important influencer in the brief psychotherapy field. And, and there is this thing that Paul Watzlawick said that in his early therapies he used a lot of formal hypnosis, but then he used more and more conversional hypnosis. Yes. So I was wondering if in brief psychotherapies there is something similar. I mean that in the early brief psychotherapy um, we we probably uh, felt uh, a lot of Ericksonian influence. And now I'm wondering if um, uh, we have a less Ericksonian influence still continuing to influence our work. Uh, which are Ericksonian concepts. What do you think about that? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, like I said, I never met Erickson, so I was influenced by people who did know him, yeah. and, uh, and then it goes on and on. But I think for many of us, Erickson was like Zeus in Greek mythology. Yeah. Realms of hypnotherapy, strategic therapy, family therapy, brief therapy, all seem to come out of his forehead or wherever wherever they came out of. Uh, I think uh, in, in the Greek mythology, it comes from Zeus's forehead and it also comes from Zeus's leg, his thigh. Yeah. Creation does, yeah. and in my in my poetic mind, when I think about it coming from his thigh, that makes me think about Erickson being in a wheelchair, and his because and because he's in a wheelchair, he has to learn how to use language more skillfully and how to observe things carefully. Yeah. So I think his great contributions was his use of language. Uh, many books have been written about Erickson. Uh, Uncommon Therapy by Haley yeah. is the first. Most people should read it. It's very, very yeah. good. Uh, we already mentioned the book on your shelf behind you, the Common Case Book by O'Hanlon, which has 343, I think, cases, a page for each case. What was the problem? What techniques were used? How did it go? What the uh, It's an interesting way to look into Erickson. Uh, I think O'Hanlon's book, Taproots, is very, very good, 1987. Another one by Dan Short, Hope and Resiliency. Short and two of Erickson's daughters wrote it. Um, uh, Erickson was a giant in many contributions. I think his most important legacy today is the idea of utilization, to utilize or use whatever the client brings to help the client solve the client's own problems. Uh, he had ideas about strategic directives, his work on hypnosis and uh, without trance communication, suggestion. Uh, a lot of what he did 
now we have absorbed it. And so we don't even think of it as Ericksonian, but getting a goal, looking for the client's strengths, finding out exceptions to the problem. What can they do well? When have they done it before? How could they do it again? Using metaphors and imagery, uh, storytelling. So uh, much like the brief therapy center at MRI, a lot of what they did when they did it was radical and groundbreaking and new, but now we just think of it as, it's just brief therapy. Uh, that's when I say like Erickson was like Zeus. I mean, it, whole different ways of thinking. Before Erickson, most therapy was the treatment of psychopathology. The patient had kind of like psychological infection yeah. and the doctor had to diagnose it, go in and get it and get rid of it. Yeah. Somehow drugs or, or, or behavior or something. But, and then Erickson said, no, let's look at what people are good at. Let's see them as functional and healthy and try to bring out the best, bring out the strength. The, an the answer is within, kind of one of Steve Langton's books, the answer is within. Uh, so I think it was an enormous paradigm shift. It went from thinking of, from pathology to problem solving. Yeah. It went, they're sick to, they know things, but they have to use what they know better. Maybe they'll learn new things, but it was a learning model, a teaching model, instead of a medical disease-oriented model. So I think it's, I think it's profound. Yeah. Uh, and, what it's, he, and it's interesting because medical was a, a doctor, a, a physician. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, Erickson was a medical doctor. Yeah. He was an MD, but he was an MD at a time when there was not a lot of good medicine in psychiatry. Uh, you know, they gave insulin shocks and they gave lobotomies and they gave these very heavy drugs to just put people to sleep. And so he had to learn other ways of working with people. He had to use his wits. Uh, there's many stories about him being, uh, as a young boy, he's paralyzed and he watches his family and he sees how if somebody says something, he discovers what they call in English a double take. You hear it? And then you realize they said something else. Oh, so he yeah. practiced things so there'd be multi-leveled communication. Then he started to try triple to take, uh, slip in embedded metaphors and messages, uh, seeding as, as uh, Jeff Zeid calls it. And so he became a, a genius at observing and using language. Uh, my, my friend, um, John Frickman, who passed away last year, and also one of Erickson's daughters, Carol Erickson, uh, used to tell me a lot of stories about Erickson would emphasize observing things, noticing how people sat, how they crossed their legs, did they have a callus on their hand, where their eyes moved, also paying real attention to what people did uh, rather than just having a theory and then always just looking to prove your theory is right. I was very interested in what the person actually brought to the room. So, uh, so it seems that the legacy of Milton Erickson is still uh, valuable, it's still big, it's still um, giving us something valuable, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, it's like somebody discovered gravity or magnetism. Yeah. Yeah. Now we've a lot of things since, but oh, electricity or magnetism or gravity, yeah. uh, they're, they're in everything we do, even though we've, we've thought of different ways to, to use them. Uh, but the, the origin, the beginning of it, I think a lot of it came, came from, from Erickson. Yeah. You know, some of, it, some of it also came, I think, from Freud. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Freud is not very popular with a lot of people nowadays, but before Freud, people, when people were, did unusual things or strange things, they were either evil, they were crazy, it was the devil, mm -hmm. or they were stupid, yeah. uh, they were ignorant. And Freud said, no, they have an unconscious, they have motivations, yeah. emotion plays a role. He got people to think about things more psychologically instead of just in terms of some moral or some educational model to, to think psychologically. And I think he was a major shift getting people to think psychologically. And then Erickson was another major shift to get think, people to think uh, adaptively or constructively or what, what useful things might, they might have. 
John Wheatland was part of this too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, um, th th this is a question I want to, to ask you uh, because, um, you know, uh, everybody knows uh, very well uh, Paul Batsvarik or Jay Ali, uh, other guys, other famous guys from uh, yeah. MRI, Mental Health Institute. Um, uh -huh. And they help us to improve uh, our skill and see the therapy in a totally different way. But, as you say, what about John Wickland? That was the master of one down position. Uh, yeah. He wrote um, less book, but it was for he, he was for sure uh, a great contributor to the brief therapy development. Yeah. My understanding is that John Weakland was hired by Gregory Bateson, along with Haley, to go study Erickson. Yeah. And they spent many weeks over many years visiting and learning from Erickson. The people who really, I met John Weakland a couple of times, but the people who really knew John hold him in the highest regard. But in general, I think Weakland is underappreciated because he was more thoughtful and he was understated. Uh, Uh, he wasn't as dramatic as some of the other people. I remember John commenting and joking that his style did not get the big keynote speaker fees. Okay. He said, oh, if I could talk like that person, I would get $5,000. Yeah. Uh, laugh about it. John started out as a chemical engineer mm -hmm. and then switched and he was in a PhD program, a combined sociology and anthropology program. So he was very interested in science as a, as a um, chemical engineer, and then in anthropology and sociology, very much observing what people did. Okay, so he got very interested in this, and then he went and worked with Bateson, and then he helped found the Brief Therapy Center at MRI. The two, uh, the two great books yeah. from MRI mm -hmm. changed 1974, and the tactics have changed, 1982, John Wheatland is an author of both of them. Yeah, He's yeah. the best author of both books. Yeah. John also was an author of the uh, the double, the famous double bind yeah. paper. It was Jackson, Bateson, Haley, and Wheatland. Yeah. He was he was also the one who went with uh, with Haley to spend all those years studying, uh, studying uh, Erickson. Uh, So he, he did a lot. And he, he was also the one that discovered uh, Steve DeShazer. Yes. Was, yeah, the master of Steve DeShazer. One of the masters of Steve yeah. DeShazer. Yeah. yeah, you can see my notes. I was about to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. John was very smart. He was low-key, low he was subtle. I think John's biggest contribution among many others, was his, theor his clear thinking and his emphasis on observation, on looking to see what's really going on, rather than just having a theory and then looking to prove that your theory was right. Uh, I think it's significant that Weakland and the early MRI group, along with Carl Rogers, were the first to do audio and video recordings of psychotherapy sessions, okay. so they could review okay. them over and over and see what really was going on. Cool. So that was a really cool. important thing. A um, couple other things. Uh, um, you know, so they had the, Wheatland was one of the, in the original MRI group who developed the idea mm -hmm. that the unsuccessful attempted solution actually perpetuates the problem. And so we have to help the client to do something different so it's not just more of the same. Okay. That was their okay. underlying idea. In 1992, 93, there was a conference held in New Orleans in honor of John Wheatland. Uh, uh, this book, Evolving Brief Therapies in Honor of John Wheatland, was published in 1999. Uh, Steve DeShazer and Wendell Ray were the, were the, were the editors of the book. <laughs> Uh, I th um, John was a great mentor for Steve DeShazer. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that really impressed me about John was when Steve, Steve started being an MRI kind of therapist. He was interested in problem formation. Mm -hmm. and pro mm -hmm. But then when Steve shifted and became more interested in solution development, um, John continued to be his best supporter that he was so open-minded, that he was a great mentor, he, uh, he wasn't jealous, he, they were also good friends. I once interviewed uh, John Wheatland with Steve, and 
I asked John what he wanted his legacy to be, how he wanted to be remembered. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and John said, I'd like my message to be, stay curious. Yeah. Stay interested, stay open-minded. So I've always appreciated John because he was open-minded, how uh, plain speaking he was. He cut through a lot of BS. He, he saw things as they really were. Uh, and that he was a, a great mentor for Steve and how open-minded he was. He was very keenly intelligent, but he was subtle. He was not exactly shy, but he would just sort of say things in a very dry, understated way. Uh, he, w he wasn't flamboyant. As you say, Wicker was, well, um, was the one who encouraged uh, Steve the Shazer to go on with ideas. And I think it's, it's very, um, it, it's great, simply great that um, he continued to support him uh, even yes. if uh, Steve starting to started to develop different ideas, but as far as we know, the Miracle Lady uh, is in Sokinberg, which yeah. used the Miracle Question for the very first time and yeah. gave great pragmatical contributions to oh. solution focused brief therapy. So, what do you think is the most important one? What, what do you think is the most important contribution that Kimberg? Uh, gave to uh, well, I, with therapy. I was fortunate that I got to know Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg pretty well. Yeah. You know, they were made as well as colleagues. Uh, I and I, I wrote papers with both of them. We visited in one another's homes. We once spent a week together in Japan, and I liked them both very much. They were very different people. Steve was an introverted minimalist. He would talk very little. He sometimes seemed to be looking at things like he was from another planet. Mm -hmm. He was kind of, and so he could see things very clearly. He was also an excellent cook. He played the saxophone. He loved baseball and particularly the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, and he loved uh, Sherlock Holmes mysteries. In fact, Steve himself was a solution detective, if you will. <laughs> So Insu, though, was much more warm and vivacious. Uh, she liked to joke. Um, I used to call her my soul sister. She was born in Seoul, Korea. But Seoul, S-O-U-L, like a soul sister, you know, they're close. And we would send funny emails back and forth, things like that. And I was very sad when they passed away. Yeah. First Steve died uh, in 2005, and then within a year or so, Insu passed away also. Uh, by the way, you mentioned we were talking before, uh, the folks at Brief, the Brief Therapy Practice in Milwaukee, in, um, in London, uh, uh, Chris Iveson, Harvey Radner, Evan George, are, in my humble opinion, the keepers of the flame. They are the best proponents of solution-focused brief therapy, and I'm sure Steve and Insu would be very pleased to see how they have refined it. Yeah. Even before the miracle question, now I'll get right to your, your question. Even before the miracle question, Alfred Adler in the 1930s talked about, if I waved a magic wand, what would be different? Yeah. So he's asking sort of a miracle question before the miracle question. Yeah. But here is the story about the miracle question. It's in my book. Yeah. It's in a footnote. I will read it to you. Yeah, so you'll have it. Thank you. In their book, The Miracle Method, Scott Miller and Sue Bird in 1995, on page 37, <laughs> recount the origins of the miracle question, which has come to be a signature characteristic of solution-focused therapy. They wrote, a woman called us in 1984 for an appointment demanding that she be seen that day because it was an emergency. She began sobbing as she told the receptionist how her husband's drinking was out of control and that he had even been violent toward her. As the client entered the therapist's office and began to sit down, the client said, my problem is so serious that it would take a miracle to solve it. The therapist, Insu, simply following the client's lead, said, well, suppose one happened. What would happen if a miracle happened? Immediately, the client began to describe what she wanted to be different about the situation that was troubling her. As she described what she wanted in more detail, a smile began to creep into her face and the tone of her voice became more hopeful. As she stood to leave the office, she told the therapist that she was feeling much better. 
The following week, she returned and she reported that she had turned that feeling to some small but significant changes in her life and in her marriage. Yeah. So a, patient, a client or a patient says, I need a miracle. And you say, okay, and if one happened, what would that be like? Supposed to know while you're sleeping, a miracle occurred. And when you woke in the morning, the problem you came to see me about is just gone. What, what would that look like? What would you notice? What would your partner notice? What would your children, what would happen next? So it's a shift from problem talk to solution talk. It's a... Uh, um, Nowadays, the, the, the guys in London might say, uh, Harvey and, and Chris uh, and Evan, they might say, what are your best hopes for today's meeting? They might not even ask the miracle question, but there's something about the miracle. It captures your imagination. A miracle happens. What would that look like? Uh, um, Steve and Insu were... Uh, they loved one another. They were a team. They were a couple. Uh, they were partners in life and in, in their work. Uh, I think that Insu, because she was so much warmer, and I, I use the word vivacious, lively and energetic, uh, I think she showed that there were different ways that one could do solution-focused therapy, mm. where Steve would be very dry and direct. He was like the Zen master, only asking Steve the right question. And for some people, that worked. But Vincent would have this twinkle in her eye and she, the way she would talk. Wow, you did that? Really? <laughs> uh, Steve, Steve wrote about Insu that Insu had um, the persona of Insu the incredulous. Wow, how did you do that? Just like he, he said, John Weakland had the persona of uh, Weakland the dense, like the dummy, uh, the, the master of one dumb. Well, help me understand, how would that work? And he was like Columbo, the yeah, detective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even, though, even though they were both brilliantly smart, not dense and not dumb and anything like that, but they found different ways of bringing out the best in people. So, um, you know, when you see the books, it's the Shazer 82, the Shazer 85, the Shazer 91, the Shazer uh, 88, 91, et cetera, et cetera. And there are also articles by the two of them. And Insu wrote several books, too, oftentimes a uh, co-author. I'm very proud to say that Insu and I wrote a, a very good paper together on couples therapy. And, uh, and I did a couple of interviews with them. Uh, but they were... Um, they were part of the great movement that Erickson started yeah. of looking for people, looking at people as though they were capable and strong. And the therapist's job is to find out what is right instead of to find out what is wrong. And once you find out what's right or good or healthy or functional or adaptive or smart or useful, how to get the person to activate that, how to get them to apply it. Uh, Erickson called it um, he had some fancy name for it, but uh, uh, I forget what it is now, but cross, cross situational learning or something, like that. how to transfer it over, how to generalize it. Uh, uh, Steve and Insu, in their very different ways, uh, would, uh, would do the same thing. They would keep asking people questions. Yeah. There's a wonderful videotape of Insu with this couple called Irreconcilable Differences. It's a beautiful videotape. I yeah. show in seminars. Uh, and how the patients are presenting problems and they have some good things going. And she is just a master of not getting caught up in the problem, but finding out, oh, you love him. Does he know that? Oh, how did you do that? Of bringing out the best people where most of us would get sucked into going for the problems. She doesn't get into the problems. She keeps her sail out of their wind, unless it's blowing where they really want to go. Uh, so she's one of the underappreciated. Steve was much more the, uh, Insu was very smart. I don't mean to say yeah, anything yeah, wrong. Yeah. Steve was much more the intellectual. Mm -hmm. Steve mm -hmm. would discuss Wittgenstein and 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 you know and and, and German philosophers and you know and Insu was more uh, warm and sort of direct and and Steve gave it sort of the intellectual um, philosophical background much yeah. much yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. that's great and uh, I'm a little. Um, 
um, I envy that you uh, knew both of them. Okay, uh, yeah. but I know you, and I'm lucky for that. <laughs> you know, the way I got to first meet them in 1988, yeah. there was the first brief therapy conference held in San Francisco, oh, yeah. and I was standing in the lobby at the hotel talking to Moshe Talmud, my friend Moshe Talmud, and Steve DeShazer came walking in. And Steve and Moshe said, oh, let me introduce you to DeShazer. Uh, Moshe had recently gone to Milwaukee to, to study, to go to a seminar or something. I'm not sure what the details were. So I met Steve and Insu and Yvonne Dolan. And then I said, oh, we're going to have a party at my house later in the week. Could you come? And Steve said, yes. And he said, and so, and he pointed about five or six people. He said, and he invited them all to the party. The party got much bigger. Yeah. So, And uh, there are other people. Uh, Mary and Bob Goulding were there. A man named Hans Strupp was there. Nick Cummings came to visit. There was a, and I realized like the history of brief therapy is in my living room. This is very <laughs> that's exciting. So great. Uh, first, I, I knew of them, but I had not really studied their work in detail. And then I took a seminar with Scott Miller. Yeah. Uh, Scott Miller came. Uh, he was on a speaking to her and he came and he gave a one day workshop I took and he got me really excited about solution focused therapy yeah. and then I got very interested and then I wrote to Steve and I said could I come and interview you and then, and then we got to know one another more it's just to uh, our audience to um, to write your books uh, constructive therapies one two and three uh, I think oh, yeah. there is uh, an interview in constructive therapies one and two to uh, see the shadow And, and uh, yeah, those two. And I'm pretty sure there is also an interview to uh, Sid Shazer and to Insel Kimberg in the other book, um, yeah. interview with a um, psychotherapy expert. I love oh, yeah. that book. I love that book. Yes. I was going to mention yeah, this. Yeah. That, so, um, yeah. last question. Please. I know that there are, as you say, plenty of names be behind Brick Psychotherapies who help them to became great and spread in the world. But there is one in particular that Michael Hoyt remembers with particular affection. Yes. Bob and Mary Goulding. Oh. Bob and Mary yeah. Goulding. In 1985, I attended the first Evolution of Psychotherapy conference. It was in Phoenix, Arizona. And I remember it well because it snowed the first day. And it never snows in Arizona, but it snowed. It was sort of like, like the gods were sending, you know, this is special. <laughs> so, and that first day when I saw Bob Goulding, I felt in love with Bob. I don't mean romantically, but I just, I connected with him. I, I, and so I got to spend a lot of time with Bob and eventually with his wife, Mary Goulding. Uh, and I took many workshops with them and I went and stayed at their residential, uh, did residential live-in workshops for a couple of weeks, trained a lot with them. Uh, by the way, Jeff Zeig trained with them also. So they, they were very influential in the field. Uh, they had developed something they called re-decision therapy, yeah. which was a combination of TA and Gestalt. And they had studied with Fritz Perls and they had studied with uh, Eric Byrne. The phrase, I'm okay, you're okay, was Bob Goulding said that first, not Eric Byrne. Uh -huh. But it goes on. But beyond their specific theory, I wrote a note to myself, I think their lasting contributions were several. Number one, they were very, very clear about the importance of getting a clear goal mm. for each therapy session, what they called the contract. Mm. And they said you can avoid a lot of resistance by having the client specify what the client wants. So we're not imposing on the client, we're serving the client's interest. So one was clear goal. Second, as they said, the power is in the patient. The power is in the patient was the idea that people have autonomy and responsibility and capacity. They have skill they can use. So we don't have to do it for them. We have to assist them in doing it. So that was the second. And the third thing that they did was they often used imagery and gestalt techniques. So they very much brought an experiential component into therapy. The therapy wasn't just an explanation talking about what's wrong, but it was also feeling yourself doing something differently, making it alive and real in the moment. Yeah. So I think that was very, very important. 
I was also going to mention somebody else who I think has been somewhat overlooked is my friend Michelle Ritterman. Okay. Uh, Michelle, okay. Michelle Ritterman uh, wrote a book. She's written several, but using hypnosis and family therapy. Mm-hmm. And Michelle was a, one of the best students of Milton Erickson. She was also a student of Haley, Salvador Mnuchin, uh, and Braulio Montalvo. Uh, and what she did was she brought together some of the ideas of structural therapy, which is looking at it from the outside, the exterior view, and the interior or hip, psychological hypnotherapy. She had the idea that symptoms were trance uh, states brought on by the family or other social forces. When she went and told Erickson about this, Erickson said, that's brilliant. I think you should work on that. I would develop that idea if I were you. Uh, It's a really interesting integration of of structural therapy or strategic therapy and more of the hypnotic kind of work. So she's really good. I also wanted to uh, mention a couple other people very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, these people are already very well known, so they're not overlooked. But I want to give a couple of shout outs, as we call them, you know, praises. One is to Bill O'Hanlon. Uh, there's many good people, but every time Bill talks and I listen, I learn something. And I think Bill has done so much. And Bill started as Erickson's gardener. He worked for Erickson. He wrote all these books about Ericksonian therapy and all these other things. The book on your shelf, The Uncommon Case Book, uh, many of Bill's books. Bill is terrific. That's one. A second person I wanted to mention was Nick or Nicholas Cummings. Oh, yeah. Dr. Cummings was the president of the American Psychological Association. All. And in addition to his advocating for psychologists and social workers and marriage and family therapists and doing all of that, he was the developer of very large health care systems that were venues for brief therapy. He was a great encourager of brief therapy. He wrote books about brief therapy. He did training in in different models of brief therapy. So his venues, uh, if you was, were places to learn to do brief therapy, and brief therapy would be appreciated. The third person, we've mentioned him a couple of times already, is Jeff Zeig. And the reason I wanted to particularly mention Jeff uh, is, in addition to his own clinical contributions, I think that his being the... uh, Architect, the director of the Erickson Foundation, the architect of the uh, evolution of psychotherapy, the brief therapy, and the couples therapy conferences, has been an enormous gift to our profession. Uh, it's created a place for us to learn about brief therapy, to have exchanges of different models. Uh, so I think uh, Jeff has created a place for brief therapy to, to grow. Uh, Nick uh, Cummings did the same thing in, in, in his own way. And, and, and Bill is just terrific. Uh, there's a, I'm sure if you ask me in a couple of hours, I'll think of other people I should. <laughs> I apologize to those people I forgot to, to mention. Uh, but yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, some of the people I've been talking about I did this book, Interviews with Brief Therapy Experts, 2001, and I went around and I interviewed Michael White, Steve DeShazer, John Weekland, uh, Bob Goulding, Ken Gergen, uh, the list goes on and on, Paul Václavic, uh, people, and we did the interviews and then we uh, put a lot of footnotes in to talk more about their theory. This, re- this was book is sort of my education in brief therapy. This was a really good one. And then last year, this came out, book of mine, collected papers. Awesome. And I think it's, it's, it, it's a good book, but it also has a lot of information about the, some of the people I've been talking about and the models of brief therapy. I want to thank you, Flavio, for this opportunity to walk down memory lane and think about the uh, Weekland and the Shazer and, and Erickson and all these people. Thank uh, you. One of, yeah, yeah. One of my jobs right now is I'm getting near the end of my career. You know, I'm, I've been doing a long time. It's not bad. Don't worry. I uh, hope not at the end, but I'm getting near the end. But I think now an important thing is to pass information on. Yeah. Otherwise, why well, have all these books and know all of this if you don't give it to somebody or use it? So I'm very excited that you're making tapes and interviewing people so that somebody can watch and say, oh, i got to check that out, or I want to learn more about that, or what was that book Michael Hoyt said, or oh, what was the best book about Haley, or where do you get the thing about Erickson? Yeah, so I think this is a really valuable thing we're doing now. Uh, there were two famous Ericksons in psychology. There's Milton Erickson. Yeah. 
uh, as we all know. But then there's also Eric Erickson. And Eric Erickson, uh, he's a different person, but Eric Erickson wrote about stages of life. And he said, when you get older, there's generativity to help the younger generation yeah. to pass to pass it on. So this makes me happy to be, uh, I feel like I'm being Ericksonian on both sides. I'm uh, talking about Milton Erickson. <laughs> But Eric Erickson is saying, yes, Eric spelled it E-R-I-K-S-O-N, no C. Yeah. That's the Danish way. With a C is the Norwegian way, apparently. Yeah. But thanks again. And uh, thank I you. hope this is. Thank you, Michael, for sharing with us all your uh, knowledge, all your exercise. Um, I hope to see you soon in Italy. Uh, actually, we will see in Italy in a month, talking about single session therapy. And I suggest to everybody that will see this interview in the next uh, months uh, on the internet to uh, read your books, attend your workshop, and um, have a talk with you because I think that you can teach a lot to everybody and to enrich everybody with your stories and with your uh, expertise. Thank you, Michael, and see you in the next time. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>